Well, hello, Antonio. Hey there, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great today. Wonderful. Hey, Antonio, for those that haven't come across you online, tell our listeners who you are, why we're talking tonight. Uh, my name is Antonio Chacha, and I am the Chief Strategy Officer for Three Axis Advisors, uh, a drug pricing and data analytics firm. And I am the CEO of 46 Brooklyn Research, which is a nonprofit dedicated to making drug pricing data more understandable and accessible to the general public. Uh, previously, I spent just over a decade with the Ohio Pharmacists Association uh, running government affairs for them. And uh, more recently, uh, my firm, Three Access Advisors, just signed uh, a contract with the American Pharmacists Association where we will be helping them uh, basically turn pharmacy, hopefully, upside down. Now, here's what I want to find out. I want to find out how I can be like you and have everybody I talk to sing my praises. Because I got a lot of people that hate me <laughs> recently at the pharmacy, but everybody I've talked to, they say, you got to talk to Antonio. You got to talk to Antonio. I'm like... Come on, he can't be all that. But I'm hearing it from everybody. So I said, I got to get Antonio on here. How do I do that? How do I rise up like you so everybody is praising me? First off, uh, don't be as overrated as me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I prefer to jump over low bars. Uh, it's easier. <laughs> uh, some of it's dumb luck. Some of it is obsessive persistence. I have, in a number of ways, found myself at the center of a lot of major pharmacy issues. Um, some of that, I believe, is, is dumb luck. Others of it is um, creating those opportunities and creating those uh, moments of disruption. Um, I've been very dissatisfied with what I see. Um, as the output from pharmacy right now, from a policy perspective. Uh, and I'm very dissatisfied with what I see from our drug supply chain as a whole. Uh, I find the system inherently backwards and broken. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's an itch. I can't just seem to finish scratching. Okay. Let's back up. You come from a background with a communications degree, not in pharmacy. And all of a sudden, this pharmacy stuff bothers the hell out of you. So where is the jump from communications back in college? And all of a sudden, you're the golden child of disruption. <laughs> where does that leap come from? So I'm glad you said child, because I'm going to rewind the tape even further. I am the son of another Tony Chacha. I'm the grandson of another Tony Chacha. Us Chachas are not very imaginative when we pick names. Uh, <laughs> So my dad, he's been a hospital pharmacist for almost 40 years. Hmm. In his spare time, uh, he worked in an independent pharmacy, and he also worked picking up shifts at small chain. Growing up, you know, I was always um, enamored with pharmacy, not because of what I got to see in the pharmacy, but because I got to see what my dad did between the hours of 7 and 9.30 at night which was when family members or friends would call him and say, Tony, I just got diagnosed with X, Y, Z. The doctor just prescribed for me ABC. And um, you know, he would basically walk them through and hold their hand, you know, how to best manage their disease state with the drug therapy that had been prescribed. Uh, generally speaking, patients felt uh, largely under-equipped uh, to deal with the disease that they had been, just been diagnosed with. And they felt under-equipped to work with the medication regimen as prescribed by that doctor. And even if they kind of understood what they were supposed to do, they trusted my dad to guide them in the right direction. To me, I found that uh, trust and, that they had in him very attractive. Um, so I actually set out to be like him. I actually started Ohio State in the pre-pharmacy program. I did about uh, a year and a half until I said, uh, organic chemistry kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. And I had worked as a pharmacy technician for three years. And, you know, I, 
I really liked the interaction and the engagement with patients, even though I didn't know anything. The lady at the fakeries would always bring over donuts. So I loved, <laughs> I, I loved, I, I just loved the, the interaction. Yeah. Um, but what I saw was a profession that was getting busier and busier and busier, more and more bogged down by insurance, you right. know, not just insurance, but I mean, you know, customers asking, well, could you help me walk down to the bleach aisle and things like that? And right. as the prescriptions are building up, building up, yeah, uh, I was like, do I really want to do this for eight years and go through the organic chemistry? Uh, no, I was much more interested in politics mm -hmm. um, and journalism, uh, which is ultimately what I pivoted course to. What was the significance of the seven to nine thirty? Was the pharmacy closed then, and your dad was given the extra effort? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It was totally closed. Uh, you know, sometimes in the, in the hospital, he wore, he, he used to work like off shifts on shifts. But when I say seven to nine thirty, I mean, that's when I saw my dad off the clock, yeah. you know, actually engaging with the patient. To me, that was pharmacy. It wasn't just making sure the green pill was the green pill and the yellow pill yeah, was right. the yellow pill. So after your poli sci and, and your communication degree, how many years after graduation then were you out of pharmacy, if you ever were, before then you got back into the leadership of it, let's say? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. <laughs> they uh, pull you back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I graduated from Ohio State, dual degrees in 2007. My first job out of college was working for an association management company. And that company managed nine different national associations at once. We essentially acted as the back office. So hmm. I ran the magazines, uh, the marketing, the communications, and some of the fundraising at those associations. Now, some of those associations were very interesting. The International Nurses Society on Addictions, the Sudden oh. Cardiac Arrest Association. And then you had far more boring uh, associations like the Association of Credit Union Internal Auditors. <laughs> wow. So I, I enjoyed that. But uh, we really were just kind of plug and chug for a different insert your association name here. Sure. Um, the company that I worked for uh, was sold to another larger association management firm in Olathe, Kansas. Um, I decided that my future was in Columbus, Ohio, not Olathe, Kansas. And so I helped transition those associations to a larger firm, at which point I reached out to Ernie Boyd, the executive director of the Ohio Pharmacists Association. I said, I said, Ernie. I know journalism and magazines. I know uh, membership uh, management. Your web platform is the exact same as the one that I just worked with. My dad's a pharmacist. My entire background was in pharmacy. At, at a fundamental level, if you come in and invite and take me up on, a, on an invite to lunch, I will promise you that Tony Chacha will buy a membership with the Ohio Pharmacists Association. And just like any good executive director of a pharmacist association does, he says, I'm going to take that membership. <laughs> yeah, and, right. And so Ernie and I uh, met up for lunch. Um, he didn't have a job open for me. Um, I explained to him what I thought I could bring. And uh, he said, look, if you um, basically help me uh, raise some money uh, and take on a bunch of responsibilities, uh, I've got a job for you. And so we built it from there. How many years ago was that? Almost 11 years ago now. Did you know him at all? I did not know Ernie Boyd at the time. I did not. How many states could you go to right now? You've, you've already did one. How many could you go to? Let's say you didn't live in Ohio. And let's say it's 2020 right now. Was the timing right? Or could you go right now to 49 of these and create a job at most of them like you did? Uh, that's a tough one, Mike. I mean, some associations have been dealt very hard hands recently. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And not just, but not just recently. I mean, some of it's some of their own doing, uh, some of it is perception that I think is unfair. Yeah. Um, some of it is fair. Associations do not have a secret magic wand sitting in the back office waiting for somebody to pull it out and wave it. Um, it's a challenging, uh, job. Um, and the resources are not there. So, I'll give you an example from this association management company I worked with. You know, half the people there, you know, association management was not their background. Uh, you know, we were paying, you know, people maybe 30, 40 grand a year 
to come in and run membership operations for national associations. Well, guess yeah. what? I mean, you can go find better work, you know, working at Amazon sometimes. Yeah, yeah right. So the associations are really victims of their own circumstances because, you know, look, just when you think you've got somebody talented, there's something better for them to do. I hope none of my employees are listening because I always think that too. I'm like, you know, if they're too good, it's like, why the hell are they working for me? <laughs> you know, I don't think, I'm not sure how that came out. I want it to come out good for them. They've got to do better than working for this old guy. But you're right. When you get someone really talented in there, they're, they stick around for a bit and then maybe they're gone. Well, part of it's just the, the economy. I mean, you can make more money maybe somewhere else. There's a saying in the association business, uh, you know, we put the non and nonprofit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, 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 and that's just, it's, it's a harsh reality. Um, I think one of the, one of the things, so, I mean, answer to your question. Yeah. I mean, I do think that, um, there are a lot of things that can be done at associations to turn them upside down, uh, in a good way. Um, I do think that associations can achieve more, but I also think that that's a partnership. Um, you know, I struggle all the time. I think, Ohio has been in the news. I think we get a lot of credit, sometimes too much. I think there's other states that do a better job sometimes. But we're like any business. You know, the Ohio Pharmacists Association, we staff according to our budget. Uh, and, you know, if we don't have the budget, we don't yeah. have the staff. Um, so a lot of associations are sitting there rubbing two sticks together, trying to conquer, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. And their members, you know, call them up and say, why haven't you, you know, killed PBMs yet? Or why am I going out of business? You know, when are you going to fix this for me? And they're sitting there with a budget of less than a million dollars going after a, a, a multi-billion dollar industry. I had my good friend over the other night, and I don't know why he asked me this, but he said, who would you consider a musical genius? And I said, well, I would consider Paul McCartney a musical genius, and I would consider, and some other names came up, and I said, I would consider John Lennon a musical genius. And he said, well, is it just... You know, is it a coincidence they were both in the Beatles? I'm like, no, but that's why they're the Beatles, you know, because they had these two guys happen to come <laughs> yeah. together. So I know I'm going to miss some names here, but recently I talked to Scott Knorr and I talked to Eric Packman. And if I've got this right, I know Eric was back in Columbus. You're in Columbus. I don't know where Scott, what part of Ohio he was from. But is that just... He was in Medina, which is near Cleveland. How far is that away? Maybe two hours, two hour drive. I'm not sure where Ringo is, but is this like a Beatles coincidence that you three <laughs> guys all kind of had this love? Because it seems like a pretty strong triangle that's making a lot of noise in a good way for pharmacy now nationwide. I think there's a little bit of talent there. I'd like to think there is, but I think it's mostly persistence. Um, an effort. Uh, every job I've ever had, uh, I started working when I was 15. My dad uh, and, and mom instilled in me the importance of, you know, going out, working hard, earning your keep, um, always being uh, as helpful as you can. Uh, I've never, um, from graduation and on, and even before that, there, I've never believed that there's such thing as a nine to five job ever. Um, I, I carry my work home to a fault. Um, and, uh, it's something I talk about with my wife all the time is that, you know, I, I have a problem turning it off. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am, um, the way that I've, I've conducted my, my career is that, uh, my cell phone goes to everybody. Um, I answer emails late sometimes, but yeah. I always email them. I'll, I'll always respond. Um, a lot of my best work occurs like my dad between the hours of seven and nine 30. Yeah. And right. now with kids, it's the hours between nine and, and midnight and one I am if, if, if I have just enough espresso. Um, but, um, I am very obsessive, uh, with, with my work and, yeah. uh, I believe that you have to be obsessive, especially if the challenge uh, requires it. And, uh, in pharmacy, I learned maybe five, six years ago that the old way of doing things and the typical amount of effort was not going to cut it if you were going to solve these existential issues that are in this profession. And I will say that while my initial motivations were being, you know, saving pharmacy, 
I believe that it is much bigger than pharmacy. It is fixing a system with which pharmacists are trapped. Um, and so uh, if you want to fix that system, you better bring your A game and bring your time. And that's that's how we typically do things. And Scott and Eric, we're a big part of that. But I mean, there's a litany of other pharmacists, um, you know, in Ohio. There's obviously Ernie Boyd, our executive director. We have Mark Kratzer, independent pharmacist, John Kohler, Barry Klein, Max Peoples. I mean, yeah. we have an amazing group of pharmacists that we there's an understanding in Ohio that we're not going to take crap anymore. And and we're going to do whatever we can to fix this system, even if sometimes it comes, you know, it's not perfect for pharmacists, but we're going to do whatever we can to fix it. On your LinkedIn background, you've got a picture and three things come to mind in that picture, a hammer, tablets scattered around, and a broken vial that was smashed by the hammer. Tell me who each of those could represent. I definitely would consider us the hammer. That, that goes without saying. Us is who? Uh, honestly, you know, us is a very informal us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, uh, you know, formally, I work with Eric Packman, Ben Link, Kaylee Boston uh, at Three Axis Advisors. Um, my board over at 46 Brooklyn, Scott McGowan, Mike Sharp, Jeff Bartone, Eric Packman. I, I consider that us. Um, I consider anybody and everybody that we've worked with to unravel the this supply chain as us. Um, I could get very formal with that. I could get very broad with that. Do the tablets and the vial, and we're just playing around here, do they represent one group? Or could you think of symbolism that represents both of them separately? Uh, the pills are actually what we want, okay? And I view the vial uh, in this context as all the proprietary black boxes and the veils of secrecy that prevent us from getting exactly what we want and what we need. Um, I very much believe in a healthy profit incentives in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, I, I disagree with um, the hurtful uh, uh, barricades that prevent us from actually having a system that um, that we deserve. Um, I think that profit in healthcare should be derived by how well you make a patient better. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, we reward those who can capitalize on conflicts of interest and a lack of transparency and completely warped incentives. Um, arbitrage is what determines the winners and losers in this system, and um, and that has to change. The vial that was smashed, uh, I heard you mention something about black, and I'm thinking dark, and I'm thinking secret. So back up on that description, who is that? It is those that stand in the way of a more efficient and value-added system. Hmm. And, and most people would probably predict me to say it's PBMs. It's not. Uh, it's not. There are, there are good PBMs out there. And there is it, there's vital PBM functionality that exists in this marketplace. Um, our job, and just like there's vital pharmacy expertise that we need mm -hmm. in this marketplace, I view every cog in the supply chain, for the most part, as vital. The key is, how do you actually bend it so that you actually get it to function in a way that you want it to? Because when you actually undress the supply chain, from top to bottom, including pharmacy, you will find that how we reward those members of the supply chain is extremely backwards. <laughs> I think that yeah. we over reward um, uh, just oversimplified bad behavior and we under reward the best behavior. Is there anything I'm missing or is it all about money? And what I mean by that is someone would say, ah, oh, it's not money, it's pride it's it's power it's this it's that but i don't think i'm missing anything is this all about money and the game's not being played right because the money points aren't going to the right people for the right reasons and so on this is borrowed you'll you'll find that i don't have perfect answers to everything because i just go i don't have perfect answers for anything <laughs> so you're ahead of me uh but but in general it, it, it's about value i mean everything that we talk about in healthcare value. now at a big in a big picture setting is 
value. So I'll, gi- I'll give you an example, okay? I always hear about major differentials in how we care for people in end of life. Hospice mm-hmm. care. You talk to somebody that has horrific hospice experiences. You talk to others that have excellent hospice uh, experiences. But when do we ask, like, how do we actually reward those who did better? And how do we penalize those who did terrible? So just a, a recent example, my grandfather, so Tony, Tony, Tony Chacha Sr., the, uh, my dad's dad, he passed away uh, three weeks ago. Okay. Oh, my condolences. No, no sweat. We're all going there one day. He was dying. Yeah. I got all. I got everything out out of him that I would ever want. Good. Um, he's an amazing man. But we we had the best hospice experience that you could imagine. And and I hate hearing when somebody does not. Well, yeah. The question that we have as a society is how do we incent what happened to Tony Chacha Senior? And disincent what happens to those who have a horrific experience. Yeah. The truth is, in many regards, we actually pay the same for those things. And so the one that did a crappy job for, you know, John Q, whoever, all right, yeah. that company got paid the same as the company that did that did work for my grandfather. And the same thing happens in pharmacy. Arguably on that, Antonio, is they got paid more because they maybe didn't have as many people there or they weren't calling on the phone as often or doing something. So they actually got more incentive. Now, it could have been that the opposite of someone of your grandpa was just a bastard and just a mean person and so on. But usually the people are good, but the system has cut corners. So they've actually got more incentive for probably giving worse service. Exactly. And this is this is what I talk about in pharmacy all the time. You know, I, I, I think pharmacy has far more value than the general public assumes, but let's just say it's not, uh, pharmacy is, is really minimal value. Okay. Yeah. Whatever value it is. Okay. I want the most of it. And so what I get frustrated by, and, and it was a guy that I, I grew up with, uh, who was uh, entered the pre-pharmacy program at Ohio state, the exact same time I did, I was working at Mark's. We had more time to work with patients um, it was a bet. It was a more reward experience. At that time, he was a technician at CVS. Okay, and that's when they introduced the red light, green light system on a computer. So if the patient had been there, you know, for a certain amount of time, yellow light, yellow light, yellow light. A patient's been there for 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 a too long a time. Red light, red light, red light. It's beeping right in your face. Okay. Well, there's nothing that, I, in a general sense, I see no difference between the pharmacist that's at Mark's Pharmacy. And the pharmacist at CVS Pharmacy. Now, granted, there's going to be differences, but the incentives drive the CVS business model. And I don't mean to single them out, but really any pharmacy, insert any pharmacy, the business model tells the pharmacy owner, tells the pharmacy manager, tells the shareholders, fill it faster, fill more of it, and fill it with less invested resources, which means spend less time with the patient. If you can do that, you will maximize your margin. Now, the same prescription could get filled across the street at insert whatever pharmacy you want. All right, Jim's Pharmacy, Jane's Pharmacy. They spend more time with the patient. They are costing themselves money. Yeah. That is an inherently broken system. And to me, when I talk about value, I want to start quantifying what Jim or Jane's Pharmacy is doing. And I want to compare that value to what's happening at the burger flipping pharmacy, because yeah. in my head, in a sloppy sense, I know which one's better, but right. we need to actually start quantifying that. And if you start bringing that down to the drug level, you know, now we'll talk about pharmacy, the business model. So right now, the primary way with which we reward a pharmacy financially is through the dispensing of a drug. Yeah. Okay. Now that has to change, but for, for right here, right now. Ninety percent of your revenue, all right, behind the counter, all right, is going to be through the dispensing of a drug. Now, some pharmacies might do some MTM, little things like sure. that, all right. But for all intents and purposes, your margin and your mission lives in the dispensing of that drug. Mm-hmm. And so, until we actually sterilize what's happening with the drug, how will you ever be able to pay for value? If you don't even know what the hell you're buying and what price it should be when you buy it. So in other words, 
the first thing that has to happen is we've got to know what the base price is. And that gets all into the rebates and DIRs and MAC fees and all that kind of crap. Is that right? Exactly correct. It's it it's boiling everything down to its base. You know, when I see something that's a mess, I want to boil it all the way down. I need to see what's happening in the foundation of that system. And when you're talking pharmacy, the foundation is dispensing. And sometimes I hate getting bogged down in dispensing because I want to talk about the other things that pharmacists are right. doing. Okay. Right. But you'll never be able to move that so long as what the overall reliance of the business model is predicated on dispensing until you fix that. I don't see anything that you can build on top of. It seems to me that for the people making a ton of money on this, a lot more money than the value is recognized, on purpose, they have obfuscated to never let anybody close to that. And if you get close to it, then they're going to hide the contract to not show you what that means and on and on. So there's a lot of people fighting you. Would that be fair to say? Ab- absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and pharmacy is the, is, is a, I think a beneficiary in this reform uh, uh, push, but I, I, I think it's really important to point out that PBMs didn't create this mess. It, actually, pharmacies were, were part of the problem 20, 30 years ago because it was pharmacy that was hiding the ball. You know, you don't know the price of the drug and I'm going to charge you whatever I want. The only competitive forces that were impacting pharmacy were whether or not the patient could get a better price across the street. Now, those are what I would consider to be traditional market forces, where a patient was making a decision based on price and service on where they wanted to get their prescriptions filled. Those are healthy competitive forces. But today, we have removed those traditional forces because right now, the payer has no power at the counter. All the power has been forfeited to the insurers and the PBMs. And the system that we have today, I think a lot of that is because we have stripped the patient of their power. When I first started, I remember my dad and I actually had a little bit of an argument. In a nutshell, Blue Cross at the time, you would tell Blue Cross what your acquisition price was. And then the audits would come back and look at your invoices and so on. But that was just before basically the first Mac list went into play. And for us at the time... I was thankful for the Mac list because then we didn't have to be thinking of what our price was and we didn't have to prove that price in an audit and pull our invoices mm-hmm. out. So I was happy when the first Mac list came way back when. Yeah, ultimately, you have uh, a needed friction. I mean, on one side of the supply chain, you have you have drug manufacturer, wholesaler, pharmacy. Each one of those entities would love for nothing more than to charge whatever they could get away with. Okay, Mm -hmm. and that was what we had, you know, 30, 40 years ago. But there was an I think there was a little bit more of an understanding that, you know, you don't fleece the public. And so even though you they could charge whatever they want for all intents and purposes, I thought that that side of the supply chain had been largely restrained. Okay, yeah. Well, then came then all of a sudden the prices started to get out of control. Manufacturers want to charge more. Wholesalers charge more. Pharmacies charge more. That created an impetus for the payer to say, look, we need somebody to get it, to get ahead of this. And so your insurers and PBMs came in and acted as a necessary friction against one side of the supply chain that wanted to charge whatever they could get away with. And so ultimately finding that balance is where that system needs to be. But what's happened over time is, is that through a number of things, uh, PBMs have grown so large that they now have excess power on the other side of the supply chain and the, the other side of the supply chain, we need a lot more than the other side. So, yeah. so now that you have all this excess power on the payer side, well, now you're starting to compromise what spits out of the other side. Your pharmacy care is going down. All right. You have massive consolidation in the wholesaler marketplace. You have a lot of consolidation in the, in the manufacturer space, and they're not bringing the same level of treatments, value added treatments to the marketplace that they were many moons ago. Does it mean that nobody's doing anything of value on the other side anymore? Absolutely not. But the excess power of the insurers and PBMs has had a deleterious effect on the output of the pharmacy wholesaler uh, manufacturer combination. If this played out again in a different universe, would it play out the same way? Was it always built that the PBMs were going to be able to 
to be the ones that consolidated and had the monopolies and things like that? Or if this played out again, if this was 1975 again and played out, is there any scenario where the pharmacist became the powerhouse or the you know the people became the powerhouse or does it always kind of play out this way i think it does i think it does i, I think it always plays out this way because you know i always say never trust anybody trust their incentives you know and that's not to say that anybody's bad or good it's saying more often than not you can trust their incentives you know what is this what does this individual or this organization have to gain and trust that when they have an opportunity to gain, they will move in that direction. And so if manufacturers could charge what they want, don't be surprised when they charge maybe more than they should. Uh, mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for wholesalers and pharmacies. And guess what? Now, now the same is true for the cops, uh, the PBMs who were hired as the cops to, to rein in the other side. Uh, now they're charging whatever they can. And now your insurers are. So at the end of the day, you don't really have anybody in the supply chain who has the right incentive to render a fair deal, not just on price, but from the actual quality of the service as well and the good. Nobody is actually there doing what needs to happen, which is finding that balance of cost and value. Did the pharmacist screw up at first by being greedy 30 years ago, causing the PBMs to come in? I agree completely with your scenario, but it doesn't seem like there's any power for the pharmacist to legally make a ton of money right now, even if they wanted to, where was that lost? Oh, they can, they can make money if they want to, but I would, I would argue that they, it would be way outside the lines of what I would consider to be ethical. Uh, <laughs> Legal, but full of loopholes and not ethical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's some companies out there that can help pharmacies make, uh, unfair money out of the system. Gotcha. I'll put a little heat on my pharmacy folks here. You know, and this is hard because, you know, not all pharmacists think alike, but, you know, look, pharmacists have a professional obligation, okay, over 90, okay, and, and there's a lot that goes into doing everything that you need to do from a compliance standpoint to meet the needs of that patient. How many pharmacists do you know that can do those things in 15 seconds? Let's face it, you can't. You cannot do a just service to the patient and do it in 15 seconds. You cannot. But there are pharmacists out there that are signing their name at the bottom of those prescriptions saying that they did. And in many ways, I feel bad for that pharmacist because they're under ridiculous expectations from whoever that they're working with. But my challenge back to those pharmacists is whose name is on the license? Whose name is on the prescription that you that you ultimately signed off on? And Pharmacists along the way allowed the business model of pharmacy to buckle them. A pharmacist, you know, obviously is relying on a paycheck in order to make ends meet. And I get that, sympathize with it, et cetera. But enough pharmacists in this profession have said, I can do this in this speed and it's okay. And so don't be surprised when the businesses that employ those pharmacists say, nice job. Thank you very much. Why isn't the guy at the next door doing it? And all of a sudden, it spirals out of control. So, yes, I do think that there could have been pushback if pharmacists in a collective fashion said, you know what? Fire me, you know, right. uh, or I'm shutting I'm, uh, I'm shutting it down. I'm not giving a flu shot now or I'm going to spend this time with the patient. I don't care who has anything to say about it. But pharmacists did not do that. And now here we are. It's get it out the door, get it out the door, get it out the door, get it out the door. Outside of like child abuse, every other situation in life, everybody's played a part in the problem. Some of it might be quite small. Some of it might be quite large, but everybody contributed to some problem. And you don't take all the blame yourself, but everybody, everybody contributed to it. That's, that's one thing that I think is really important. And I, and I, I felt, I felt the pressure when I started doing government affairs for the pharmacist association I felt the pressure from the other state organizations. I felt the pressure from the national organizations. I felt the pressure from my own membership. I felt the pressure from my boss that pharmacy does nothing wrong and, and everybody else is the villain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what you learn along the way is that, no, look, nothing is black and white. Everything is degrees. And to, and to pretend that pharmacy has no problems 
to pretend that that pharmacists, you know, have no responsibility to bear for this system um, is just inaccurate. And doesn't mean that that pharmacists are bad. It doesn't mean that PBMs are inherently bad. What it means is that we have a system that has run amok. Yeah. Okay. For whatever reason, whatever that is, understandable reasons or or not understandable reasons, the system is broken, and it is on every member of that system to make it better. Yeah. Back to the APHA stuff. You know, I've known Scott for a long time, and Scott wanted to hire me at, at APHA as as a as a bona fide staff member. And I said, look, Scott, it's it's very important to me that, you know, I have I have started in pharmacy. Yes, I, I bleed pharmacy. I know pharmacy can do more. I know pharmacists can help patients, but I find it very important to advise rather than be advised because I don't trust any member of the supply chain uh, as much as I trust myself. And, and I, we really believe that this system has to be fixed and we need to be able to talk about it in as objective of a fashion as possible, which is why we are so obsessive with the data. And we are putting out reports telling you what happened to the monthly prices of hydroxychloroquine and lisinopril. Who cares except us? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But that's how detailed that we feel we have to be because we want it all out there so that we can see every little piece of how the system works because you will never fix it unless you see how it's uh, how it works in operation. Say that part again, Antonio, about you want to advised instead of be advised. It's very important to me um, that what we do, our mission is to fix a system. And so let's say, for example, and, and this this is all, this is kind of it's part of its trust, but part of it's just a, an important ph philosophical delineation as well. Like I know APHA, I trust APHA. Um, I know pharmacists, I trust pharmacists. I know some companies, you know, in the supply chain I trust. But again, I don't trust anybody. I trust their incentives, all right? APHA, you know, ultimately works for pharmacists. That's important. I think that pharmacists, you know, deserve a much better system than what we have today. But sometimes pharmacists, I'll, I'll, use, I'll use examples in Ohio. I've had instances where pharmacists ask for things that I think are not good things for the system as a whole. Mm. And so I push back on them. So I feel it's very important. Um, we've built enough of a reputation. We've built enough of a, of a, uh, of a, I hate calling it brand because it sounds so stupid and manufactured, but um, for lack of a better term, you know, yeah. brand that we are here to call balls and yeah. strikes. And, and I, and we want, we have always tried to position ourselves after we finally, you know, got everything off the ground. We said, we want to make sure that we're always in a position to call balls and strikes. And we don't want any, we don't want anything uh, polluting our ability to do that. Being advised would be more like being an elected official with constituents telling you what they want. And you're saying, no, I've got enough to bring to the table where I want to give the advisement. And that's a gift I'm giving. I'm not just here to serve constituents that may, but quite likely might not have the root of the problem at heart. Yeah. I mean, look, one day we might fall flat on our face and I might be in a position where in order to put food on the table, I've got to do things that I'll have to hold my nose for. But we built our reputation uh, by not being anybody's sock puppet. Yeah. And, uh, and, and as long as we can keep it that way, we're going to, these are things that I've had conversations with Scott. I've talked to Michael Hogue about this too, the president of APHA, uh, that look, I'm not saying that we're right about everything. Right. I think that we're right about a lot. Um, but I think that where the system needs to go, I think that pharmacists will be very happy in the system that we think needs to exist. And based on that, um, and this is this is why I think APHA is is of real value to pharmacists is that you know, look they're not just going to sit here and shill for things that just make a system worse uh, you know they 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 reward pharmacists at the expense of you know patients et cetera et cetera you know I have seen from the APHA board and from Scott a willingness to call balls and strikes within this uh, profession within this industry. And so long as is they or any in, in entity that wants to work with us is willing to do that 
and will let us do what it, what we think is right, we will be willing to work with them. This thought then, if I got this right, that's the reason why that Antonio doesn't necessarily become an employee of APHA. It's really the three axis that's hired because that maintains your strong identity that you're there as advisement, not to necessarily take every, as respectful as I can, every whim of the pharmacist in the group and then try to run with that when you may not believe that's the the base of the, the cause. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for APHA, but let's just say, let's just say in our drug pricing research, we found that pharmacists were making five thousand uh, dollars in margin per prescription on you know generic Abilify. Yeah, is that okay? Whether it's APHA, NACDS, NCPA, uh, they might say, "Hey, maybe we don't want to talk about that." Right. You know, <laughs> maybe, you know, we're getting killed on all these other prescriptions. Hey, let's 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 not talk about that one. No, no, we're going to talk about that one. <laughs> we're going to talk about every drug that we think is overpriced, regardless of whether the pharmacy is making the money or the PBM is making the money, because we want to know, look, why is that drug so overpriced? You know, look, maybe we want to pay $5,000 a script for uh, a, an organ transplant drug that makes sure the patient stays out of the hospital. Yeah, right. That makes sense. OK, yeah. let's pay the pharmacist to keep the patient out of the hospital. But for just an everyday run of the mill script, we should be paying for the actual value and so a lot of the data research that we've done will show, hey, you know, there's generic Levec is paying out $5,000 a script. Why is CVS Caremark paying that? I'll never forget. I, I was I was presenting at the uh, at the Pharmacist Society of the state of New York. And I was um, this is after we did a project for them over at three axis. It was the first big Medicaid project we did after my work in Ohio. And a pharmacist came up to me, a guy I knew, and he said, hey, you know, that generic Levec thing, you really shouldn't be talking about that because it's making up for all the other losses that I've been getting. And I was like, look, look, I get it. I, I feel, I feel your pain. Like I don't, but, but I don't want you to get the underpayments and I don't want you to get the overpayments. You know, you, you shouldn't screw the, you shouldn't have that incentive uh, to go out and chase these prescriptions. That'll make you 5,000 because you're going to spend exponential time with that patient. And you're going to leave all these other patients, uh, you know, by the wayside. You know, I want you to have an even incentive when you're dispensing those drugs. And if we're going to add an incentive, I want there to be a value attached to it. I want you to do something more and be rewarded for more. Because otherwise, all right, the other pharmacies that are just doing it, kicking out, kicking out, kicking out, all right, they're going to get over rewarded because they didn't spend time with that patient. You know, it sounds sloppy, but that's what motivates me. And 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 I think people should be should be enthused because you know, APHA is willing to willing to engage on those terms. I, I believe they genuinely want system reform for the better. That is really interesting because that's really hard to get across. When you've got someone like Scott and his enthusiasm <laughs> and his cheerleader, you know, and he says, you know, look out, here comes Antonio, you know, and, and it's on fire. Some people follow this guy named Jesus, you know, and everybody said he's going to come and be the king and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, like the way he wins is up on the cross. And I kind of picture like <laughs> Scott saying, here comes the <laughs> king of Ohio. Here comes Antonio and he's going to do this and this. And all of a sudden, you know, you put this report out and stuff. But the thing is, I talking to you. And that's why I love this long form talk is because this is where you have the time to say, no, look at Scott and APHA is investing in this base. And the base is what changes because anybody can get out and just, you know, pick at the PBMs or something. This is where it changes. But I imagine, and this isn't really a question, I guess it's more of a comment. It must be hard for Scott and you to get across that here comes Antonio, but it comes kind of as a whisper almost, but a very strong bass whisper. You know what I mean? I, I know exactly what you're saying. You, you mentioned like, okay, why, why, why the buzz? Okay. Uh, uh, on the onset. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a brief story. So when Ernie Boyd turned me on to lobbying for the pharmacist association, one of the first things they had me do he said, Antonio, we need you to work on MAC pricing reform. Okay. It's a big priority. We had just gotten done our, our PBM audit bill and um, NCPA had been parading around this map 
of the United States that colored in all the states that had a MAC pricing bill passed, okay? And Ohio wasn't colored in. So all my members here look at me and say, what the hell, Antonio? You suck until you turn that white Ohio blue. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I'm, okay, I'm, I'm going to go, go pass a MAC bill. Well, um, we ended up uh, passing what was at the time heralded by NCPA as one of the most amazing PBM Mac pricing laws in the country. Uh, it had un- unprecedented transparency, blah, 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 blah. The press release was amazing. You would think that pharmacy just died and gone to heaven. Um, you know, our speaker of the house at the time really, uh, uh, we called in major chits to get this thing done. We moved heaven and earth and it got passed. Like the week before it went into effect, Express Scripts sent new contracts out to all the pharmacies saying, <laughs> we don't use Mac anymore. We use uh, yeah, generic yeah. effective rates. I will never, ever forget. I mean, Mike, I worked my I worked my butt off. I mean, we, we did everything we could to pass the best bill that we could. Uh, you know, we had crossed the finish line and all of a sudden they took the trophy away. And, and so I called um, a gentleman at NCPA who's no longer there. Uh, and I said, Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, right. Wait, they can do that? <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're seeing more of that now. And I'm like, yeah. dude, you got to be kidding me. Like, I just called it. I, I sold my whole membership on on this. We just put out the press release yeah. saying how great we are. The Speaker of the House called me cussing up a storm about everything that he was going to do, PBMs and their mothers. And, and, and you know, we, we thought that we had just done everything that we needed to do. And here they knew that it it wasn't perfect. If it sounds like I'm being derogatory to NCPA, I don't mean to because I love NCPA. But like, I'll never forget, I flew back to D.C. uh, for an event. I don't know what it was. And I said, I am going to NCPA. I need to see the whites of this guy's eyeballs when I talk to him about this. Because as somebody who takes his work very seriously uh, and doesn't want to and doesn't want to undermine himself in the eyes of the members and of the legislature. I had to know why were you parading around the stupid map, you know, of saying, go pass this bill when it actually doesn't do anything. And so I, I went in, I asked him, I said, tell me out of all these blue states that you've circled in on this map, how many of these states have actually solved the problem? Can you guess, Mike? Zero. 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 And so I said, so what are we doing? What, like, if this is what what you told me and my members, this was a top priority. My members listen to you, okay? And and they're telling me this is the number one priority. And so I used all of pharmacy's chits, all of pharmacy's credibility to pass something that didn't work. You have to be kidding me. And so it was at that time where I said, we are not going to follow these, these people's playbooks anymore. All right. I'm not walking in to a lawmaker's office and say, here's five claims that Joe, the pharmacist, was underpaid on. Mm -hmm. Because I remember, I'll never forget, I was in in a meeting with a CVS Caremark lobbyist. And he said, hey, all those underpayments look bad. Is that pharmacy where those claims are from still open? I said, yeah. He's like, well, maybe he's making Mm -hmm. some money on some claims. I was like, shit, I, (laughs) I need to figure this out. And so I went back to the pharmacies and asked, hey, well, show me the claims where you're making money. And sure enough, it's like, they're losing a hundred. They're making a hundred. Like this doesn't make any sense. And so we just we just, we just start completely over. And now, in fact, the insurances are like you know we're not going to wait around for that again. We're going to put right in the contract that if if the government gets rid of DIR fees, we're going to do this. And if they do that, we're going to do this. I mean, they're like in their own contract. They're like three steps ahead. Totally. And, and that's when I decided no more fake wins. You know, no more. You know, no more. Yeah, you know, we're gonna we're gonna pass this prototype bill. We're going to vet things. We're going to talk about things and we're going to look at the big picture. And so part of the reason that, again, I think some of this over credibility that I've that I've been able to get is, is that we just decided, like, look, we're not going to do what they what everybody tells us to do anymore. We are going to say what actually makes a system better, because right now, if this current system is able to go on the autopilot that it's currently on and left unchecked, this profession and pharmacy benefits a whole as a whole are heading off of a cliff. And so I feel that we need to stop messing around with these little like chintzy bills 
that do not accomplish things. And I think that we need to be going for the whole enchilada, which is not just getting pharmacists paid $50 a prescription or whatever it is. We need to go after complete and fundamental payment reform. We need dispensing to be a known, predictable, set level margin across the board so that the incentives are equally spread across. And we need to start moving profits into the outcome of the patient and the service being rendered by the pharmacist. Once you do that, and it, it, it's, not, it's magic wand stuff. I mean, it's way harder than what, what I've framed it. But it is incredibly important for both the chain pharmacists who sit in there pumping out 500 scripts, uh, all the way to the independent pharmacists, to the Amcare pharmacists, you name it. But every pharmacist deserves a system that rewards them when they make patients better. Because what it does is it makes those pharmacists that go above and beyond and impacts a patient in a good way, they become more successful and they are over rewarded. And conversely, the pharmacy that operates in the back of the liquor store, you know, that's not spending time with the patient, that's just flipping them, flipping them across the counter and not spending any time, that pharmacy probably goes out of business. And and that's probably a really good thing. Antonio, is there any law that needs to be changed or could be changed to improve everything? Or is this all incentive, period? And if you set things up right and make the right incentives, basically you don't need the laws to make the incentives. I mean, that's the question. Are there any laws that can't be manipulated by someone to keep the system bad? Yeah, I mean, I think there's some things that can be done. I mean, I, I, I've learned that laws are, are imperfect. Um, you know, even if you think you've outsmarted the industry, you know, the industry is paid well to, to outsmart, uh, yeah. you know, those laws. Um, but, you know, for example, you know, if, you know, if I have a pro, if, if, if I'm a kid and I have a problem keeping my car, you know, out of a ditch or, or under 60, you know, it's probably smart for my dad to take my keys away. So one of the things that we've note that we've seen in our data um, time and time and again is that PBMs are taking advantage of a lack of transparency and horrible conflicts of interest, and they are fleecing the system, uh, you know, in, in a number of ways, whether it's spread pricing, specialty pharmacy overpricing, steering, you know, transaction fees, GER, BER, dispensing fee effective rates that we're seeing now. Like there are a number of things that they can do. Um, to game price for their own advantage. One thing that I think from a policy perspective, and I don't know if this is FTC or, or Senate, whatever the hell, I, I don't know exactly where it is, but if you're a PBM and you have a vested business interest in pharmacy, you have no business setting price in that system. Um, so rather than allow them, you know, just pass the law, fix the MAC, no, no. You know, so long as PBMs have a vested interest in the supply chain or in, in pharmacy, I think that there should be a strict prohibition on their ability to set prices for their own pharmacies and for their competitor pharmacies, because time and time again, we've seen them abuse that that uh, that power. You've got basically PBMs owning pharmacies, they're owning wholesalers, and there's other stuff in there too. I mean, there's there's this vertical thing going up a mile high with with ownership of stuff, and at least... You're not saying necessarily cut those all apart, but at least you're not going to be setting the prices and making your pharmacy make more than the next one and so on. Exactly. I had people beat me up uh, back when the um, the CVS Aetna merger was going on. They said, this is the biggest thing that's coming. You know, we need to fix this. I was like, eh, you know, CVS Aetna, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to throw pom-poms on <laughs> or anything, but like, you know, to me, the fight was CVS Caremark, n not Caremark Aetna. That 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 does not scare me. Um, you know, as I said before, you have two sides of a supply chain, and it, and a lot of people want to kill PBMs, go, do away with PBMs. I think, as I said, a lot of their functionality is still needed, but at a simple level, I think it's okay to get rid of PBMs. Their functionality, I would argue, should have been with the insurer all along. You know, why I, I part of the reason that I think pharmacy is stuck in this predicament is because they've been outsourced 
They're on an island. They're no longer integrated in with the overall goals of the health insurer. Now they're under the thumb of this PBM that does not have the same incentives as the health insurer. So, um, you know, I'd like to see PBMs go away, not for the same reasons that, that I think a lot of pharmacists want them to go away, because I want that functionality back in the back in the mothership of the insurance company. I, I would take my chances with an insurer all day relative to a PBM. So, Antonio, you and Eric, I'm going to give you this magic button. And with this button, all time stops. Okay, the world stops. You then work with APHA and you and Eric get to have your fun with all the numbers and things like that. I talked to Eric. I know how much he loves all that stuff. How long would you keep that button stopped before you'd want to go in and like try stuff or say, hey, give this, you know, try this one on for size APHA or let's throw this in front of some uh legal things and stuff. I mean, would that be like a hundred years that you'd like to do this before and, and give them this full package? <laughs> or do you guys enjoy or desire some like feedback? Would you like to be on this for like a year before you show anybody or five years before you show anybody and then turn that button back on? It's a hard question to answer because I uh, like, as you say that, I know there's a lot that needs to be done. And it takes a lot of time to do it, but um, I am uh, very restless, uh, and I just like to go. And going also means seeing the results, probably. Exactly, exactly. Because look, this is, you know, this is this is not a science. You know, this is this is a work in progress. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, as much as we get into the PBM stuff and the drug pricing stuff, I love all that stuff. It is fun. But you know what I like the most is getting pharmacists in a position to actually render a higher standard of care to a patient. So we, we, you know, we've been talking for an hour. We haven't even talked about like the thing that I actually am most proud of is that, you know, one of the biggest things in pharmacy is provider status. Okay. In the state of Ohio, I now have four of the five Medicaid managed care plans that have all launched programs that are paying pharmacists for clinical services rendered under the medical benefit. Okay. So we have, uh, we've been working with United Healthcare uh, since April of of 2019, uh, getting that off the ground. It formally launched on April 20 uh, uh, April 2020. Um, we have um, Buckeye Health Plan, which is the Centene plan in Ohio, that's working with two FQHCs and a health system. UHC is working with two uh, independent pharmacies. Uh, we have CareSource that is now off the ground with two independent pharmacies and a health system. And, um, you know, here very soon, we're going to have Molina jumping in with uh, about 10 pharmacies, community pharmacies. And each one of those plans already has pharmacies on deck. And they're doing it without the Department of Medicaid authorizing provider ID numbers, which means that they're paying out of their own admin costs, not their medical expenditures. They are paying out of their admin to pay pharmacists for clinical services, transitions of care, bringing diabetic patients to goal blood pressure monitoring, all the things that we know pharmacists can do, those are all programs that are off the ground right now. Ohio is ground zero for provider status. To me, the most important, the most exciting thing is like, yeah, I want to sterilize all this drug pricing fat. And it's fun to, be, you know, expose the, the bad guys. Um, but at the end of the day, like, what do we actually want? We want a system that actually uses the expertise of the pharmacist to make patients better to bring value back to plan sponsors. That, that is what drives me. So yeah, you could slow this damn uh, war, uh, world down for, for 500 years, we probably wouldn't be done. But I say, why stop it? Okay, so it sounds to me that this whole PBM thing, that's what you were talking more the base of getting the dispensing across the board and fixing that and so on. But the cool things you're talking about with the provider status, that has probably less to do with that base being needed. Or 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 am I wrong? Did you bring a lot of the data from 46 Brooklyn and 3Axis to them? And did you have to get that quickly through their mind in order to build these? Or was that more separate? Uh, you know, they're, they're in tandem. I mean, look, 
you know, if you're the American Pharmacists Association, much like we were at the Ohio Pharmacists Association, at the end of the day, your pharmacist, your practitioner, whether you view them as a dispenser or a cl- or a clinician, they are sandwiched between that 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 supply chain that I mentioned: drug maker, wholesaler, pharmacy, PBM, uh, insurance company. That's where they're stuck. Okay, and so what I would like to see is hopefully that core part of the business, the dispensing function, be uh, uh, as close to a break-even proposition as possible down the road. Okay. Now, now, yeah, pharmacists should make profit. Absolutely. Okay. But dispensing right now, all almost all the profitability is reliant on the dispensing. I want to minimize that over time. And I want to grow the incentive or grow where profitability resides into the actual care of that patient. And so it's impossible to divorce those two things because look, you could start over rewarding Jim's pharmacy. Who's just kicking butt and grab every, every patient staying out of the hospital. Well, if all of a sudden Express Scripts figures out, hey, Jim's pharmacy is really kicking butt, let's just slash his MAC rates because he's making so much money on the medical benefit. No, that, that, that doesn't fix anything, okay? You want those pharmacies that do the best. You want them over-rewarded. And so some pharmacists will hear that and say, oh, my God, you know, another salesman for value. Well, great. PBMs are already uh, grading us out on value, and now I'm getting DIR fees. And trust me, I get all that. The key is, is the PBM who has a conflict of interest in the pharmacy marketplace shouldn't be setting those 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 metrics either. You know, ultimately we need really, really objectively set prices and objectively set measures for what makes a patient better. The second that an entity that you compete with is setting those measures, they are completely broken at that point. You cannot trust those metrics at that point. So that's why sterilizing those conflicts of interest goes far beyond Oh, will I get paid enough for lisinopril this week? No, 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 no. It was way beyond that. Pharmacists will not li- will not be able to work in a system that pushes them forward and encourages them to succeed so long as their competitors are setting, have their finger on the dial that determines how profitable they'll be. That's exactly right. I've always said that with wholesalers, they have their fingers and everything. They don't really care how family life is at someone's household. They want they want to see the pharmacy, arguably, in some cases. Some cases, they don't care. A lot of times, though, they want to see the pharmacy survive enough to stay open, but not much more than that, you know? You know, PCMA has a big ad campaign out right now talking about, hey, pharmacies don't have it so bad. You know, some states have more pharmacies than they did 10 years ago, blah, blah, blah. Look, access is important. The standard of care is way more important. Uh, you know, when, when I read stories like the Ellen Gabler New York Times article, yeah. that sickens me because that's the output of our system. OK. And a pharmacist wanted to be like, well, it's the PBM's fault that, you know, that that's happening. No, it is the system design and PBMs are exploiting that system design. Yes, they are accentuating pharmacies, bad incentive problem. But this is not a PBM only problem. This is a fundamental problem within the business model of pharmacy. And I think it is on, it is incumbent upon APHA, NCPA, OPA, you know, ASHP. I don't care who it is. So long as you're a pharmacist, you took an oath to care for that patient. And right now, this system disincentivizes the care of that patient. Every single pharmacist should be disgusted with how this system is designed and should be actively working to do whatever they can to make it better. Is there any finish line? Is this a Super Bowl or is this like, you know, four out of seven wins, you know, like a playoff, more like how many wins did you get this month or this quarter? It almost seems like a ongoing graph kind of thing to to measure. And I will say a lot of times they're blind wins. I mean, nobody sees anything going on and then something pops up and it's like, that's a miracle. It's like, no, it's not. We've been working on this for five years. Using that analogy, I would say we're a nine and six team uh, uh, on the verge of not making the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is that pharmacy has become obscenely compromised by mm-hmm. the business model. And meanwhile, you have other healthcare providers that are that are seizing other opportunities that are moving yeah. ahead of pharmacy. Uh, conversely, and I'm not prude to technician responsibilities. I think technicians can and mm-hmm. should do a lot more. But you have this major push by the major pharmacy chains uh, and the mail order companies to move technicians into 
roles that they've not traditionally had before. Techni- technician immunizations, tech check mm-hmm. tech, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things that I'm I'm comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with in the current environment where there is a lack of accountability in terms of the quality of, 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 of what's being rendered at one pharmacy versus another. I think technicians can do much more. I think they can do a good job at some of this, but I also don't trust handing you know the CEOs of our largest pharmacy organizations and companies to say, hey, you know, will you tell us if there's a problem with technicians doing something? Uh, of course not. You know, the, the logo of the of the Fortune 500 company is always smiling. So, um, you know, I don't trust giving that power to these companies because they have shown that they cannot be trusted with it. Uh, so if, if we all of a sudden give away the farm to the to, to, to technicians, if we give away the farm to, you know, uh, PillPack and Amazon and, you know, XYZ mail order pharmacy, and we look, we can still make sure the yellow pill is the yellow pill. But what did we lose when we when we push for this over efficient model of pharmacy? That patient engagement is crucial to their outcome, and we don't quantify that. So I'm I'm okay with a lot of these advancements. It's not not that I'm one to stand in a way with it, but I wake up almost every morning thinking pharmacy is on its deathbed. Okay, the role of the pharmacist could be eliminated tomorrow, and we never gave it a chance. Um, that's the stuff that I think about, which is why you know, look, we need to be progressive. We need to be moving. We need to be embracing change. But we need to be controlling what that change is, because there are some that would do it just to yield higher returns back to shareholders, and they would do so in a second, even if it came at the expense of the value of the overall system that cares for our grandparents, our parents, et cetera. Antonio, are you glad that you're not a pharmacist? I really could care less. Uh, I think it'd be cool. Uh, I, I, I know my dad would, would have, would have loved it, but, um, in many ways, I really like looking at it from the outside. Now I I feel like, 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 like more of an insider now. I mean, if I did, if I didn't, there'd be something wrong with me. Um, but I will say that the ability to look at it with a fresh, uh, set of eyes, you know, when I switched out of pharmacy, I actually switched to journalism and, and I look at pharmacy like a journalist. Um, it's part of the reason that the whole Columbus dispatch thing just blew up. I mean, you know, we looked at things, uh, in Ohio, like a case that had to be cracked (laughs) and, and we were obsessive with telling that story and that obsession with telling the story, that fresh set of eyes that wasn't trained, like, Hey, this is how the system is. Both Eric and I were able to come in as, you know, quasi outsiders to say, Whoa, whoa, whoa! This is how it works. No, 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 no! This is this. This can't be how it works. Sometimes you either have golden handcuffs as a pharmacist, not so much more now, but a lot of times you have like you're kind of stuck thinking, "Well, I'm going to do this because doing something outside of the norm of this would be too risky," and sometimes I almost wish that somebody would take my degree away from me and just force me to force me to go out and and, and do it and it's easy for me to say because I just had a nice nice dinner at home and I'm still affording things but sometimes I kind of wish that I I was forced out I understand that um, because what you're I, I think what you're saying is it might give you even added motivation it'd almost be nice to someone say no no more and it's like oh shit now I'm forced to go and do something different. Yeah, um, it, that um, that that hunger or that 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 extra motivation, however you want to phrase it, is is very healthy, especially in a time where where there's needed change. Um, it's part of what um, attracted me to uh, working with APHA. But we look, we have other people that we work with, the American Pharmacy Cooperative, which is a pharmacy buying group based out of Alabama. Tim Hamrick, Susan Mays, and Bill Ely, um, you know, have always been kind of color outside the lines, think differently, uh, you know, don't just tweak it, reform it uh, types. Um, And most of the people that we, that I've found that I work best with are those types of people that, you know, let's not just go halfway, let's actually do it. Um, And that's one of the things I've been, um, in my limited exposure to ABHA previously, I knew Janelle Sabatka and I knew Mary Alice Bennett, both of which are past presidents of APHA. 
And what I knew about them is that they were extremely passionate about elevating the role of the profession. Um, I usually took APHA. My perception of APHA was that very fluffy, you know, oh, we like the profession, you know, how wonderful we are. Um, and, and I knew Tom Minigan and I always thought, you know, his, you know, general demeanor left me with the impression of, of quiet, um, which can be falsely construed as uh, disinterested or unmotivated, which he was not like Tim, Tom Minigan was an amazing, amazing guy. Yeah. Um, what I've learned about APHA is that they actually want these system changes but I think part of the reason they brought Scott in is because that outward perception was that everything's okay, you know, pharmacy, great. Um, and this is why I'm really, I mean, I, I've talked with Sandra Leal. Yeah. I've talked with Kathy Kuhn on their board who came from, who obviously is Ohio, and then Michael Hogue. And, you know, you don't hire Scott and want to go halfway. No, <laughs> no, 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 you, you don't. You just don't. No, you don't. And, and my warning to them is, it would, again, like based on my perception is, look, make sure you really want change, because if you want change, you hire Scott. And if you're kind of on the fence with change and you want to kind of be restrained, you don't hire Scott. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Scott told me when we spoke a few weeks ago, he said either he's going to get kicked out in six months by the board or or he's or it's going to work. You know, you don't go halfway. And I applaud them for taking that that, uh, you know, for them, it's it's a risk. I don't view Scott as is an inherent risk because I I've, I've known Scott for over 10 years and um, you know, I can, I know his pluses. I know his minuses. Uh, you better believe after he called Larry Merlot Lucifer, I called him. I said, I don't know if that's a good idea, dude. <laughs> uh, but, but look, I mean, I, I, I think, I, I think big picture, you know um, I think we need to be uh, assertive. I think we need to call it, call it like it is. But I think we need to be ready to work with people that we also perceive to be against us, um, whether that's doctors, nurses, PBMs, insurance companies, you name it. Um, I've sat in a room with you know the CEOs of uh, of United Healthcare, Molina, et cetera. You know, I've I've gone all the way up the food chain up to the mothership, not just at the state level. And these are people that you can break bread with. Um, you know, you we have to understand where their incentives are. Um, and, and try to meet them at a place where we have commonality. And look, does that mean that we stop fighting OptumRx tomorrow? Absolutely not. I'll be issuing a report tomorrow on it or something, you know. But 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 look, we as long as we are we are clear and um, and objective with what it is that we want to accomplish. So long as those things aren't just, eh, let's pay pharmacists more money. No, no, no. Right. If we can actually help them make a better system, provide a better value to patients, yeah, we might have to push them up against the corner like we did in Ohio to, to get them there. Yeah. But the key is you can get them there. And so what I'm hoping that I could do, not just with APHA, but any of any of the people we work with, is provide that level of accountability and that heat that pushes people to make this system better. I'm an older guy, and, and Antonio, you're you're not a millennial, are you? You're a. I think I just made the cut. I'm I'm 37. You know, I remember the old days, and you do too, where these guys would hash it out in the House and in the Senate, and then they'd go out for a couple of beers afterwards. You know, and I love talking to Scott, and I love the analogy you use about balls and strikes because you can still go in talking with the PBM guys or this or that, and the count might be off. It might be three balls and one strike, or one ball and two strikes or something. But just because there's a strike or just because of there's a ball doesn't mean you never talk to that guy again. You know, you're still up to bat. You find the commonality. You're never going to find someone perfect. If you wait till they're perfect before you talk, it's not going to happen. Everybody's going to be out of a job. We need to learn who they are too. I mean, look, I have my thoughts on, you know, what the leadership of CVS Caremark is like. I have my thoughts on what the uh, leadership of United Healthcare is. You know, it, Cigna, you name it. Do, am I right? No, I haven't sat down with them. I haven't talked to them. Look, one thing that I've learned in this business, there are vendors for everything. Okay. And like, we like to, we, I think as pharmacy, if I was to rewind the tape seven years, I would sit there and think that there's some, there's some sinister man behind a cloak who's dialing up the rates, you know, <laughs> screwing Jim's pharmacy. That's, 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 it's not true at all. Most of them, you know, have no idea how their own businesses operate. They hire good people 
who find good widgets to maximize profitability. You know, there, there are, there are tools out there that could just autopilot this stuff and maximize profits. So look, you know, look, those companies will defend those practices until they're blue in the face because ultimately they work for their shareholders. But we as pharmacy need to recognize that, that look, there are humans on the other side and not all humans are perfect by any stretch, but trust that there's probably some good humans over on the other side that you might be able to actually meet in the middle and say, hey, maybe the system shouldn't work like that. I think there are, but I probably don't help. Like I tell my son, and he's not in pharmacy, but he's part of the business. I say to him, that person you just talked to on the phone from the PBM, I said, they have no idea how much we hate them. (laughs) 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 But I couldn't control myself. But they don't. They think they're part of this system. Unless they're in the customer complaint department or something, they think they're doing their thing and in there. My mother-in-law has a sign on her fridge and it says, there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that I forget the punchline, but basically, you know, keep going kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, look, you mentioned, you know, these, these current times. Okay. 2020 has taught us anything. There's a lot of good people out there and there's a few bad ones. Okay. Uh, And that's true in everywhere. And so I, some of the best pharmacists I know are CVS pharmacists. I know some great uh, PBM uh, uh, pharmacists who are genuinely working to do good. Do they control, yeah. you know, the MAC rates of pharmacy? Absolutely not. Okay. You know, there, there's going to be villains within all these companies. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of really good people too. And I, I, my job isn't to sort them out. I could really care less. My job is to see where their incentives are and look at the data. <laughs> the data tells me that the system with which these people are operating in is, is not working the way it should be. And so I am agnostic on the individuals, um, pharmacists included. Not all pharmacists are great. Uh, most of them are, but not all of them are great. So, you know, look, we we should we as you know individuals, you know anybody listening to this, we should be working to build a better system, and we should be agnostic on who it impacts uh, from a business perspective. We should hope that ultimately that sin, that the system is what's best for the patient. And I think pharmacists need to be empowered and sustainable in a way that they can help benefit that patient. But you know, we need to be wedded to the cause of a better system for the patient more so than anything. And, and I know in some of my conversations with APHA, that's, that's something that they've talked about a lot is pay, think of the patient first before anything else. If you wake up every morning and you know you've got somebody working on bringing everything to light and then you do the best that you can do each time for a patient. There's no guarantee, but it sounds like that's a pretty good mix going forward. A- absolutely. And, th- and that's one thing I'd give credit to the Ohio Pharmacists Association. You know, Ernie Boyd, you know, the executive director there, but also the board, you know, Bridget Groves, who just uh, left as president, and TJ Grimm, who's the current president. One of the things that that I I've really loved about Ohio, which is why I would never leave them high and dry, is that they really got it. You know, they really understood that it's not just about shilling for pharmacists. You know, you need to have pharmacists back. You know, absolutely, but you should never advocate for something that undermines what is a better system for the patient. In, in Ohio, we're really able to do that. And, I, and again, back to why you were asking before, but why the buzz? I feel that we've been successful because we've always kept that in mind. We're, yeah. We've always been willing to talk about things that most uh, traditionally we wouldn't want to talk about. Um, we've been willing to say, look, yeah, this would be really good for pharmacists, but this might not be that great for you as a payer. And, and because of that, we've built up a lot of credibility. That's why we've been in Axios. It's why we've been in NPR, USA Today, LA Times. One of the things, and Scott talked about this too, and to me, as an outsider looking at pharmacy years ago, you know, when we first started really taking on uh, you know, a bigger role in this marketplace nationally, you know, when, when pharmacy stories would hit the media, I would look and see like, who's talking about pharmacy? And, and it was, I, I would look, I, I couldn't find, I couldn't find our national leaders from our national organizations. I would see Scott Knorr's name, or I'd see my name, or I'd see some researcher at you know, Vanderbilt or something like that, Stacey DeSetson or something. I'm like, why, uh, why is it, and maybe no fault of their own, but why is it 
that when an issue impacting pharmacy or drug pricing occurs, why is it that Axios calls my phone number? Why is it that Ed Silverman at Stat News is calling Scott Knorr? They should be calling APHA. They should be calling NCPA, but they're not doing that enough. Um, it's not that they're not doing that. It's not to downplay them. But like, I think that the reason that we've been as successful as we have been is because that ability to speak as objectively about the marketplace as possible has endeared us to media enough that they seek out our opinions because it comes without filter. So your point about saying, well, it might be good for pharmacy, but maybe not so good for the payer. There might not be an answer for that right away. But the the reason the press is coming to you is because they don't maybe want that packaged answer. They trust somebody who says this might not be good for the payer. It might be good for the pharmacy. Because we've been willing to give them the nuanced answer. You know, that look, like this isn't cut and dry. You know, this, uh, you know, and look, let's just say, let's just say I did that. Let's just say, look, you know, Bob Herman at Axios, you know, you're going to ask me about pharmacy. Okay. And I'm going to tell you, look, this is perfect. It's the best. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, this, it, there's nothing wrong with this. And then all of a sudden, whatever it is passes or takes effect, occurs, whatever it is. And all of a sudden pharmacists get this big win, but it comes at the expense of, uh, of the patient or the plan sponsor. Well, well then what the hell am I then? You know, you know, so, so congratulations, you got one win and you lost everything forever. You know, if you are unwilling to, to be open about this stuff, you will just be another insert name here, uh, you know, on one side of an argument versus another side. And that's the crap that PCMA does. OK, and, and, and I, I believe that pharmacy should be more exalted than that. I think pharmacy should always position itself as, you know, we're not going to do that crap. Um, uh, I. I don't know. I don't know if pharmacy collectively can do that, um, but I know that that's what we're going to do. Well, I think we're in a really cool time. I mean, me 15 years ago, the only time that I had a chance to talk would be when one of the local reporters would say, give us 10 seconds. I mean, in 10 seconds, you either say this is good or this is bad. You don't get into a three hour or 20 page, <laughs> yep, 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 you know? Yep. So, so this is, this is a real quality time, a real special time in, in history that people can spend some time in and hopefully understand deeper issues instead of just jumping right away to one side or the other. Yeah. I mean, look, the Columbus dispatch arguably put us on the map back in 2018. And, you know, that, that took months and months of meetings and poking and prodding you know, they, they were, they, they, we were literally sitting at the Columbus Italian club reading spreadsheets and they were quizzing me on it, you know, like, we, like w tell me, all right, wait, 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 wait a second. What about this? What about this? Like, you have to be willing to tell those nuanced stories because look, look what it turned into. The dispatch has done over 160 stories on, on drug pricing and PBMs. Okay. So, so look like it, Yeah. If you want to, if you want a pithy comment, you want, you, you know, you want to, influence something you know uh, for like a second go by all means do it and again back back to you know what we try to do and the people that we work with like we if if you want to like throw a bunch of crap out there and like you know try and basically pull the people over people's eyes that undermines our credibility that is why uh i'm i'm really excited about where things are at right now because i feel like the the credit that we've been able to get has been deserved, um, par partly because I think our data work is, is is the best out there. But like, aside from that is, is that we've been willing to be open and honest about all of it. You got it. That's exactly right. And that's where the credibility comes. Yeah, for sure. Well, Antonio, your legendary status has only grown in my eyes now that I've had a chance <laughs> to talk to you for an hour and a half here. So my goodness, I'm really excited to see what's going to be going on. Yeah, I mean, it, it, look, it, as far as and I think what 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 caused you to um, at least bring me on right now is the APHA announcement. And and the thing that I would say is, you know, I've had a good working relationship with Scott over the years and I've gotten to know a lot of the people at APHA um, over the last two weeks, uh, especially. And from a pharmacy perspective, because I know that's a predominant part of your audience, um, I think you're going to see uh, my advice to them. Uh, and, and our discussion so far has been, let's start thinking differently. 
and let's start attacking these things differently. Um, let's be louder, uh, but let's also be smarter too. That's not to say that they haven't been loud enough or that uh, they haven't been loud. They haven't been smart. It's just that, um, you know, I, I plan to architect things in a very different way. And I think that if APHA can thread that needle and Lord knows if anybody can do it, it's Scott, um, you know, APHA can reclaim the podium. Uh, and be an authoritative voice, not just on drug pricing, not just on pharmacists, uh, but the pharmacy uh, pharmacy marketplace as a whole and everything that impacts the pharmacist by establishing that credibility and being assertive and gaining that credibility. I believe APHA can be the biggest influencer that there is in this profession. Um, and the question is, what do they do once they have it? You know, hopefully uh, they they work to actually change what I think is uh, a system run amok. And I, I, I believe that they will. We are ready for upheaval. Instead of pitchforks, we have Excel sheets. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right, Antonio, it's been a pleasure. We'll certainly keep in touch. Same here, Mike. Thanks a lot for what you do. All right. Thanks, Antonio.